Okay, so for our next speaker and our final speaker, uh, I can't believe I have the pleasure of introducing him, but um, he is a serial entrepreneur, a mentor, and most importantly a DJ. But more important than that, he's my personal mentor, and he is probably the smartest guy I know, and obviously the best dressed guy I know. Uh, so let's give a warm welcome to Satish Bell. Hello! You, can you say hello back? Hello back. Okay, I, I would hello back. Some of you said hello. Let's say hello back. hello back. Okay, and I'll tell you why I said you said that. I'm gonna use it. I didn't think I was gonna use it, but I'm gonna use it. Uh, thank you for the great intro. If you're having a fun time so far, please give it up to the organizers one more time. It's a lot of work to organize something like this. Okay, um, so I was thinking about how to talk about mindset today. I'm obviously a little bit older than all you guys in here, so I've got a bit more of life uh, that I could share. Um, and this is, a, this is one of my favorite topics because, you know, whether we call it mindset or what we used to call back in the day just a hustle that you go through, um, there's an interesting sort of thread. So uh, I'm going to share a story. I like telling stories. I'm a storyteller, uh, so I'll tell you guys a story. Um, I was born in 1975, and for the first 12 years of my life, I grew up in Singapore. And for the first three years of my life, before I got into school, I was a fun, loving, carefree little kid. My parents were like, yeah, you can do anything. Jump and fly and dream, and I was like, yes. And then I went into kindergarten, and then JK, and then SK, and by the time I was four or five, they figured out I was a pretty stupid kid. I wasn't good in school, and back then, we didn't have a name for it, but as everybody knows it now, I was ADD, so I couldn't sit still, and so that took on other labels like troublemaker, and, and so when I hear the new intro of entrepreneur and mentor and all this stuff, I'm like, man, you know, those are great labels, but for the first 10, 12 years of my life, I had a whole different version of myself. And what's interesting about this is, for me, those labels was what I believe was about me. Because the people that are telling me these things are who? My mom, my dad, my teachers, right? Peers. And so, why would I not believe them? I'm 12, I'm 11, 10. So why would I not believe you? Because I believe everything else you tell me. Don't touch fire. You could die if you do this. Don't eat this. Eat that. So if I believe 90% of what you tell me, why would I not believe the other 10%? So I believed that that's who I was. That I'm good enough for a blue collar job. That uh, I'll never amount to anything. I'm a disappointment because of the eldest son of a, a family with, with a very strong Indian dad. And I was convinced by the time I was 13 or 14 that this is the life I'm going to live. And as fate would have it, uh, I didn't truly believe it, even though I told myself that that's what I'm supposed to be. Because, and I don't know how many of you had this, but I used to have all sorts of crazy visions and dreams where the guy in that dream was not the guy that I was when I was awake. I imagined myself on stages, I had suits on, I was popular, I had things to say, I'm talking to people. And this is like 8, 9, 10, 11. So I used to wake up and write these things down and go, well, where is that vision coming from? Because I don't have any famous uncles. My parents are everyday blue collar folks. So where is this vision coming from? And why does that feel so good and natural? But as soon as I wake up, I've got a whole different reality in front of me. How many of you have ever felt that? Right? So, uh, just around 14 or so, we got really lucky. I grew up in Singapore, and everybody, when you turn 
14 in Singapore, you have to join the military. And so my parents are like, well, who's ever gonna invade Singapore? Why are we gonna spend a year in military? So why don't we move? So we had an option to come to Canada. I had no idea what Canada was about. They gave us really nice brochures and we looked at it and I was like, this is so cool. White people, amazing. Uh, and Singapore is very segregated. So I grew up looking at girls but never being close enough. So I was like, wow, like I'm in a classroom with women, it's crazy, right? Um, so we landed in Scarborough and anybody from Scarborough? Okay, so Scarborough is not what the brochure said, okay? <laughs> And this is 1989, so I was like, what is going on here? Um, but one of the greatest things is, you know, being able to go to, you know, high school and, and, and meeting others in Scarborough, which is one of the most diverse communities that I've ever been part of. And I still live in Scarborough, and I love everything about Scarborough. But I remember the first uh, six months of school, I didn't talk. I was shy. I was like, what if I open my mouth? People don't know me here, so... The sooner I open my mouth, the faster they're gonna find out that I'm dumb, I'm stupid, I'm useless. So if I'm just quiet, I don't say anything, keep my mouth shut, nobody will know, which is cool, right? Because I wanted to leave all that back in Singapore. And I remember I was taking English in grade nine and everybody had to read a little passage. Everybody, anybody remember that stress where you're sitting and you want to be quiet and you don't want anybody to know you, and the teacher's like, everybody's gonna read a page today. I'm like, fuck, I don't wanna read a page. Um, and mind you, I'm fluent in English, like Singapore, English is first language, so it wasn't like I didn't know the language, I just didn't wanna open my mouth, because I'm reminded of what I know I was supposed to be. So then eventually, my turn comes, nervous, I'm starting to sweat, and she's like, look, even if you're fumbling, we'll help you, just read. It was Macbeth, so I stood up, oh, and I read, okay, what well, felt like, like an hour, it was literally two minutes, reading one single page, and I read it, and, and I look up, and like, there's, everybody's looking at me for some reason, and the teacher's like, what the fuck is this guy, how come he can read English, and people are just staring at me like, it's the first day in class, so I sat down at the end of the class, packing up my notes, and she's like, Satish, can you hang back for a minute? trouble. So she walked over and she said, I had no idea you can speak English. You've been in this class for two months or three months and I had no idea. Like, is everything okay at home? Are you being abused? And I'm like, well, I'm from an Indian family, so it's a given that there's some sort of abuse happening, but, you know, uh, no. And she's like, so what is wrong? And I told her, I said, you know, this is, this is what I believe to be true. So, I didn't want to open my mouth and get everybody to understand that this is who I am. And she changed my life, this lady. She looked at me and said, I don't know what version you're looking at, but I see a passionate, charismatic young man with a bright future. And I literally stood there with this volcano of emotions because I've never heard that about me, ever, in those 14 years. So I'm sitting there going, well, who's right now? Because she's a grown-up, she's a teacher, she's molding us young minds. I believe everything else she said about Shakespeare so far. So why wouldn't I believe her? But then, like three months ago, I was in Singapore, and there was a different version of myself. So who's right? Am I charismatic, passionate, with a bright future? Or am I dumb, stupid, and blue-collar? And it was the very first time I realized that all of these belief systems that I've created up to that moment was not mine. It was 100% passed down by everybody that I've encountered. And what I also didn't realize up to the very single moment is I had a choice on changing it. Because most of us don't think we have a choice. We get labeled introvert by some uncle and you're like, yeah, he's shy. He's an introvert. Or you get labeled something different. And so for me, this idea of a mindset, and this idea of, of personal growth is about survival. 
Because at that moment I realized at 14 that maybe these dreams that I had, these visions that I had, maybe that is a glimpse into what my real potential is. And it's deep inside, I just didn't know how to tap into it. But if this one particular teacher who has never really spoken to me before can inspire me to think that there's a different version of myself potentially possible, then how do I question everything about myself? And at age 14, I started this personal journey of life hacking everything about myself. Every belief system that I've ever had to that day, I wanted to demolish and I wanted to know if I could spend the rest of my life looking at how do I build the best version of me and also know that the best version of me will continue to change based on my age, my lifestyle, my goals, my purpose, the people I want to surround myself with. Now, this is pre-internet. There's no Gary Vaynerchuk. There's no YouTube, right? And I didn't even have any role models. So I created very simple rules for myself that I still use today. Step one, I needed to give myself permission to unlearn everything I knew. And a lot of us don't do that, okay? We, we talk about it, yeah, I can change, man, like I can change, but we don't truly on an emotional level give ourselves permission to unlearn who we are. And until you can really tell yourself it's okay to let go of this version, you cannot make space to become a new version. Does that make sense? If it does, put your hand up. Cool. So that's what I did. And this is a complex three-step process which I'm gonna shrink into like a three minute for you guys. So step one was to really just tell myself, Satish, I give you permission to unlearn the systems that don't empower you anymore. Labels that no longer work for you. So the act of unlearning for me was to be brutally honest and to write down the shit that I didn't like. I'm not shy. I am actually a fucking amazing extrovert. So I don't wanna be shy. I am smart when it comes to certain things. There's a lot of things I'm dumb about, but who cares? The things that I'm smart at, I am the smartest guy I know, right? I wanna be charismatic. I love talking and telling stories. I didn't know that meant a sales career 10 years later, but these are things I wrote down on a piece of paper of things I wanted to be. But that wasn't enough because it wasn't big enough. It wasn't big enough to get me to like really change. So I said, what other motivation do I have? So I turned to TV. Five minutes? Oh, okay. Give me the cut when you want. Um, so I said, okay, how do I now emulate or literally copy somebody that I love, real or fictional, and create a version of that until I can catch up to it? So back in the days, there used to be a TV show called Family Ties. Anybody heard of it? Okay, there's a lead character named Alex Keaton. Real super cool, nerdy dude, Michael J. Fox played that character. I loved everything about that character, man. Uh, how he dressed, this briefcase, his hairstyle, his swagger, everything. I'm like, man, until I get a better version, I want to be that guy. So in high school, I started wearing sweaters and khakis. Sucks in my dating life, but cool. I was like, hey, I was one of the first kids to have a briefcase. Nerdy as hell, but... I felt good, I felt like I was turning into something totally different. And so number two is this notion of dreaming. When you give yourself permission to unlearn, you then make room to dream about a version that you want without fear, without, without limitations. And that's really important. And if you can dream a version of yourself that you can see in your head, picture it, super clean, perfect. If you cannot, Find somebody who you admire and tell yourself you want to be that person until you find a better version of, the, of yourself or somebody else. And I've been doing that pretty much my entire life because until I found a version of myself that I loved, the only other person I can look at is people that inspired me. So I would take pieces and assemble this list of characteristics that I liked and then I started to work on it. And the third puzzle part to this puzzle this is 1%, and everybody knows 1% every single day you want to improve, but I actually did it. Like every single day, I found a way to become a little bit better at the labels that I wanted to become. So I'll give you a quick example. I started my first company in university, uh, mainly because 
I didn't understand what GPAs were really about. So I went to class, but I didn't really study that hard because I figured if I got a computer science degree and you got a computer science degree, it's the same. But I didn't realize if you had a higher GPA than me, you can get a better job. I was like, damn, it's too late to figure out the GPA thing. I'm already in third year, so how can I now dream and unlearn the fact that I'm gonna be a smart graduate? Because I didn't think it was important. So then um, I decided, well, the one thing I had to do is get better at networking. Because a lot of the guys in my class had the same characteristics. They were proud to say, we're computer nerds. We're introverts. We don't have skills to be social. We don't go to networking. And they held those really close to their heart as like these badges of honor. I said, great, you can own it. I'm gonna do something different. So then I went out and looked at every networking event that happened in the city. And we're talking like my fourth year, right? I'm nervous, I've never actually met anybody. I've never networked, I've never pitched. But I needed to be in that environment to figure out how can I break out of my shy shop. So I literally for a year went to at least one networking event every single day. I didn't care if it was tech, food related, poetry nights, book readings. If there was five people in a room, I wanted to be the sixth person. Because I needed to figure out how to become comfortable around others and talking. And in that personal journey, I learned not just about how to engage people and, and break into circles and have conversations, but I learned how to figure out how to become a little bit smarter about the world because I realized after three months, if I didn't expand my vision of the world, I ran out of shit to talk about. So now I've got a reason to read the newspaper, read books, read articles. And it made me a better person, but that wasn't the reason I started to do it. And so a year later, I could walk into any room and I would be the spotlight. If there's a mic, I wanted it. And I made sure by the time I left any networking event that at least the majority of them will know me by name or remember something I said to them and there's a chance that we're gonna be doing business together. But it took 12 months of daily consistent effort, right? And so when you look at sort of the effort you gotta put into to get from the unlearning part, the dream part, and then putting in that 1%, it's a lot of work, but why wouldn't you wanna put in the work to be the best you? Because we do that in everything else. You wanna get bigger muscles? You gotta plan for it. You wanna lose weight? You gotta plan for it. So if you want a better version of yourself, because that version is gonna make you become more successful, make you more useful to the world, then why wouldn't you? And that was really my motivation, and I've been doing it for the last whew, 25 years. Uh, I've developed a public brand called Daisy Fest, which is my DJ name, or that's me. And in the last 20 years, just to give you a quick evolution and success of this new version, I've successfully started and exited three different tech companies. I've hired hundreds of people. I've got over $50 million in sales that I've done over the last 10 years. I've won awards. I've started a non-for-profit which is a music festival bringing the entire South Asian community together. It's our 13th year. And the only difference between this kid and the kid from 14 is I chose to figure out how I can be the best version of myself and put in the work to become that. And I'm nobody really special. Like, I wasn't born in a rich family. I didn't have a golden spoon. I just imagined the version that I wanted to be the world would benefit from it, and how can I go about doing it? And really, believe me when I say it, if I can do it with this formula, every one of you can. And it's not just about big, dramatic, personal growth. If there's anything you want to change about yourself, the process can work. That's my story, hope you enjoyed it. Thank you, Justin, for inviting me to speak. Very appreciate it.